In 2019, the Czech Republic got two more additions to the UNESCO World Heritage List, and in 2021, another two, bringing the grand total to 16. This makes us 20th in the world for number of total sites, just behind Portugal and just ahead of Belgium, South Korea, and Sweden. However, if we're just counting UNESCO cultural sites, we are 15th in the world. Not bad for a country of 10.3 million people. We've already taken a look at the previous 12 in earlier episodes, so we'll finish out the list with the most recent entries, all four of which are here in Bohemia and three of which are part of larger listings that cross national borders. A city is much more than just a collection of buildings. It's a location, it's a history, it's a culture, it's ideas and ideals, and a city is also, most importantly, the people in it. This is Prague Times, the podcast that takes a look at the city of Prague in the Czech Republic. With more than a thousand years of history, there's a lot to talk about. We'll talk about the past of Prague, but we'll also talk about the city as it is today, future plans for the city, and much more. It's Prague then, Prague now, and Prague later. And this is Prague Times. The first 2019 edition was the Erzgebirge or Krushnohorji mining region in North Bohemia, which is part of a larger shared listing. The Ore Mountains, in German called the Erz Mountains, and the Krušne Mountains in Czech, spread from southeast Germany into northwest Bohemia. As the name suggests, there's been a lot of mining in the area over the past 800 years with numerous technological innovations. This UNESCO listing covers an area 95 by 45 kilometers, containing 22 separate sites, five of them here and the other 17 in Germany. Silver was first discovered up here in 1168 near the university town of Freiburg in Saxony, a place whose old town is included in this UNESCO listing. This area became one of the main silver-producing parts of Europe in the 14th, 15th, and 16th centuries. Here in Bohemia, the town of Krupka became another main metal mining center, not just silver, but also tin, copper, iron, lead, and mercury. In the 16th century, as these minerals started to become depleted, cobalt was discovered, which kept the miners working well into the 18th century. Then in the 19th and 20th centuries, anthracite, sometimes known as hard coal, and then uranium were found in the mountains as well. I'm sorry, did you say uranium? Yes, I did. Near the town of Yakimov, which was known by its German name of Joachimsthal, or St. Joachim's Valley, until 1945, Way back in the 16th century, this was an area mainly known for silver. And in fact, the story here very much parallels that of Kutnohora, another silver mining town mentioned in a previous UNESCO episode. In 1545, Tal was the second largest settlement in the entire kingdom of Bohemia. This is back when Ferdinand I was king, the first of the last line of Habsburgs. It's thought that the Joachimstala, a silver coin minted here, ended up becoming the de facto currency throughout Europe, again, much as the earlier coins from Kutnohora did. And the name got shortened from Joachim's Tala to just Tala, which eventually morphed in Dutch to Dala, which then became the English word dollar. This is part of my theory that the Czechs secretly rule the world. The mine here also produced nickel and bismuth, and the town boasted a huge tobacco factory, again, weirdly like Kutnohora does today. More than a thousand women worked in this factory, as well as other factories where gloves, corks, and bobbin lace was made. Bobbin lace is a twisted, braided type of lace. And of course, uranium, as I mentioned before, was also mined here. This radioactive element was first discovered in 1789 by a German chemist in Berlin, with the first samples isolated by a French chemist in 1824. The fact that it's radioactive was discovered by another French scientist in 1896. He was building on the discovery of X-rays the previous year. And that same year, Maria Skłodowska Curie, yes, Madame Curie, found the element radium in some spoil from the uranium mining, a discovery that would get her the Nobel Prize for Physics in 1903, and the Nobel Prize for Chemistry in 1911. 
Radium is an even heavier alkaline metallic element that comes about from the decay of uranium. It glows in the dark and had many applications, and yes, it was first discovered here in Yakimov. In fact, this was the only place in the world you could get it until World War I. The town of Yakimov has been well known as a radon spa starting back in 1864. Radon is a lightly radioactive gas. And the very first radon spa in the world opened here in 1906, becoming part of the famous Bohemia Spa region. There are many radon spas today scattered about Europe, but these waters have the highest concentration of the gas. Radon spas are used to treat joint problems, diabetes, gout, skin diseases, and neurological orders, as well as hasten healing after serious accidents. Because the radon gas filters up through the water, it's not really dangerous to humans. But mining for uranium and radium is dangerous. In 1929, a Prague doctor named Lovi noticed that workers in the radium mine were getting cancer due to what he called mysterious emanations. Today we'd say radiation poisoning. These workers were given higher pay, but work continued and many of them died. When the Nazis annexed the Sudetenland, Yakimov was part of that area and much of the radioactive material that went into their search for the atomic bomb came from here. Once the communists came into power, they continued mining, often sending political prisoners and people who expressed dissatisfaction with Stalinism to work and, let's face it, die here. Nearby, in the town of Ostrov, about four kilometers south of Yakimov, uranium was sorted by hand in a large red brick structure that became known as the Red Tower of Death. The average life expectancy for Yakimov mine workers and uranium sorters was 42 years. This continued until 1964, when the mine was finally closed. Recent discoveries of indium, tungsten, lithium, and more tin means that the Yakimov region will continue to be of interest to resource extraction companies. Now, not far away, there's another mining landscape, which is part of this UNESCO listing called the Abertami Bojidar Horni Blatna mining landscape. Like the other bits of Bohemia included in this, there are museums to the mining history of the area, walking trails through forests, there's an 85 meter tall lookout tower, and two interesting natural pits. The ice pit, a very narrow 15 meter deep hole, really just a crack in the rock, up at the Yuji mine that never sees sunlight and so there is ice down at the bottom of it all year round. There is also the Wolf Pit, part of the collapse of what was once the largest mine around here, the Wolfgang Mine. That one is 85 meters deep. Obviously, over on the German side, there are way more places of interest for people who are super, super interested in mining. You may find links to these places in the episode notes. The second thing to get on the list in 2019 was the landscape for breeding and training ceremonial carriage horses at Kladruby nad Labem near Pardubice. The bohemian city of Pardubice is famous for horses. In fact, they host the oldest cross-country horse race of them all, started in 1874, the notorious Great Pardubice Steeplechase, every October. At 6.9 kilometers long with 31 obstacles, it's considered the toughest steeplechase course in the world. Cloud Ruby is 25 kilometers west of Pardubice. The stud farm here is one of the oldest in the world, dating all the way back to 1579, founded by King of Bohemia and Holy Roman Emperor Rudolf II, and it is well known for breeding the very rare Claude Ruber horses, which were once used by the Habsburgs and even today are used as ceremonial horses by the Swedish royal court. The farm itself is part of the UNESCO listing, being an example of specialized farm architecture using French and British elements known as ferme orne, or ornamental farm, in which the landscaping is laid out in particularly aesthetically pleasing ways. This dates back to the romantics of the late 18th and early 19th century, an attempt to approximate a pastoral paradise here on earth, an accessible Arcadia. There's not much to see in the village, which only has about 600 inhabitants. There is a zamek, and you can 
Visit the farm, though each little bit of the farm has a separate admission. A 45-minute tour of the stables is 200 crowns. Another 45-minute tour of the carriage house and a post office museum, which includes T.G. Masaryk's carriage, is 135 crowns. A tour through the Zamek, also 45 minutes, is 90 crowns. A visit to the forest room, which is one of the oldest Baroque log cabins in the area and which boasts something called a carriage ride simulator, is only 45 crowns and only takes 30 minutes. There's also a 17-meter high lookout tower that you can pay 30 crowns for the option to climb the 87 steps up and take a gander at the countryside. And of course, Pado de Bica isn't far and is worth strolling around in. The larger and quite interesting city of Hradec Kralova is only 25 kilometers north of Pado de Bica, and Kutnohora, mentioned in a previous UNESCO episode, is 45 kilometers to the west. So you could easily make a weekend excursion from Prague to this area. If you want to add a little more time, you could pop up to the spa town of Podjebrady, about 30 kilometers from Kutnohora, but only 20 kilometers from the larger city of Kolin, which you would almost certainly pass through to get to either of these areas. The first 2021 listing, and part of another shared listing, is the ancient and primeval beech forests of the Carpathians and other regions of Europe. The Czech area is around the city of Liberec in northern Bohemia. Beech trees loom large in the Bohemian mind and in their lore, and yes, they're all over Europe. This particular UNESCO listing encompasses 94 separate parts in 18 countries, but it's the Czech section that just got added to the master list, particularly the area around the Yzera Mountains. The beech trees here are part of the sub-Atlantic Hercynic beech forest region, which also includes parts of Germany, France, and Switzerland. The Yzera Mountains are not terribly high. The tallest peak, Visoka Kopa, which means tall mountain, is just over the border in Poland. It's only 1,126 meters above sea level, and its prominence is a mere 240 meters. As with so many of the mountain ranges here, I like to say that this area was spectacular 400 million years ago. The Ezra Mountains are mainly made of granite, with some basalt and mica mixed in. The most striking attraction in the area is the massive TV tower slash restaurant slash hotel slash ski resort at Yeshed, which is also on the UNESCO tentative list, added there in 2007. It was built between 1966 and 1973, and the hyperboloid structure remains an iconic example of architectural design from that period. It feels like a retro spaceship, a past vision of what the future might be like. Nearby, you can see the offbeat sculpture Mali Martian, or Little Martian, by artist Yaroslav Rona. This area is a popular winter destination and is known for cross-country ski trails. In the area, there are 16 viewing towers, of which there is public access to 10 of them. An elegant lodge known as the Prezidentska Chata has been used by Czech presidents since the 1950s. There is a well-known steppe cascade waterfall called the Long Waterfall on the Cherna Desna River, which flows from the Soch Dam to the village of Desna. It's really not one waterfall, it's a series of smaller cascades, but it's quite lovely. This whole area is also very famous for glass making, especially the glass jewelry and Christmas decorations in and near Jablonec nad Niso, which with 45,000 people is the second largest city in the region after Liberec. Every summer, Jablonec plays host to the Kreka Krasa, or Fragile Beauty Fair, which showcases the latest in glass artwork. You can also visit a museum of glass in the town, plus a permanent glass trade fair at the Palace Plus building, not too far from the Volt Brewery. The Jezera Mountains are between the city of Liberec and the Polish border, so it makes sense to use Liberec as a base of operations when exploring here. This city of 100,000 people or so has got a pretty nice preserved historical center. You saw it in the big fire elemental battle scene in the film Spider-Man Far From Home. Even though that was set in Prague, that sequence was filmed on Namiesti Dr. Edvard Benesha in Liberec, where there's the lovely Renaissance Revival Town Hall. Alternatively, you could focus on Jablonec, or you could switch between the two. There's a tram that connects the two cities, which are only 13 kilometers apart, that runs every 15 to 20 minutes. 
There are some half-timbered houses called the Waldsteinski Domki, the oldest structures in the city. Libres has a thriving cafe scene and plenty of pubs, to be expected, in the fifth largest city in the country. There's a fairly large water park, which has a water roller coaster, a well-regarded zoo, and what many people consider to be one of the best science museums in all of Central Europe, IQlandia. It's very interactive and appeals to both adults and kids, includes a 3D planetarium, the first humanoid robot in the Czech Republic, and even astronaut training for the youngsters. The museum is 320 crowns for adults, 210 crowns for kids, and better pricing for families and groups. The interactive science and entertainment center IQ Park is 220 crowns for adults, 170 crowns for kids, and the planetarium is 150 crowns for adults and 120 crowns for kids. 25 kilometers north of Librets is the city of Friedland, literally a mile from the Polish border. Much smaller than Librets and Jablonets with only 8,000 people, it's got some very nice architecture, a castle, a chateau, a nice main square, an interesting but unusual museum called Spitalek about the area and the archaeological finds found there, but also about a little hospital that was in this building in the 13th century. And I mean little. It only had space for six patients at a time. In a small wooden house, there is a wooden nativity scene called the Friedlansky Bethlehem that took 60 years to carve and polish. It boasts around 300 figures and the whole thing moves when a caretaker turns a crank. Also, the very good Albrecht beer is made here in Friedland, so make sure to check that out. There's plenty more to see in the region. There's a church with a relic of St. Valentine, so they say, in the town of Heinitza. There's a spa town called Lajnia Liebverda, where there's a restaurant inside of a huge wooden barrel. A whole village of half-timbered houses called Vishnova and another one called Viska. And for those that feel like getting a little pampering in, the luxury spa hotel Antonia in Friedland with a weird spaceship-like oval meeting room sitting on top of it. Rooms at that hotel run an average of 2,500 crowns, but there is a rather extensive collection of facilities to partake in. And yes, of course, there are the beach forests, which is what this UNESCO listing is all about. But the whole area is worth exploring at length, and you may find yourself returning many, many times. The final UNESCO listing added last year in 2021 is also the most comprehensive and largest. It is part of the great spa towns of Europe. This listing comprises 11 spa towns in seven countries. The town of Spa in Belgium, which is where we get the word spa, Vichy in France, Montecatini Terme in Italy, Bath in the UK, baden by Wien in Austria, Bad Ems, Bon Kissingen, and Baden Baden in Germany, and three here in Bohemia Carlo Vivari, Marianska Lasnia, and Franciszkowi Lasnia, also known as the Bohemia Spa Triangle. You will note that only Germany and the Czech Republic have multiple listings in this entry. So, meh. You could argue that the oldest of the three here is Marianska Lasnia or Marienbad, as it was known in German and as it appears in the 1961 film by Alain René last year at Marienbad. The Bohemian rulers, the Przemyslids, encouraged German occupation in this area until the 11th century, and the first written records go all the way back to 1273 when a village named Uschowice was mentioned. The first written account of a spring here is from 1341, which belonged to the Tepla Abbey. In the late 18th century, the abbey's physician, a guy named Josef Nea, became convinced the waters held curative properties and the spa industry was born here, with a spate of building that resulted in Marianska Lasnia receiving a town charter in 1863. The name comes from Marian gas, or sometimes called Mars gas, a 99.7% CO2 concentration that infuses the very first spring found, and is also used for dry gas baths and seeps into nearby peat bogs in which you can also hang out. Fifty years after becoming an official town, more than a million bottles of Marian bad water are being exported every year. The golden era of Marianska Lasnia, roughly 1870 to 1914, the outbreak of World War I, saw an astonishing growth spurt and it remains a living museum to the architecture of the time. 
Notables like Goethe, who wrote a poem about it, Chopin, Wagner, Nietzsche, Alfred Nobel, Thomas Edison, Mark Twain, King Edward VII of the United Kingdom, the Russian Tsar Nicholas II, and Emperor Franz Josef I all helped make this one of the top spa towns on the continent. 20,000 people a year visited the 100 springs in the area, of which 53 are tapped, and 40 of them are within the town borders. Churches and leisure facilities sprung up accordingly. All of this in a town of only 10,000 people in 1921. Later, U.S. General George Patton and Winston Churchill would also take the waters here. After World War II, the mainly German residents were all expelled from Czechoslovakia. Once the communists took power in 1948, foreigners were forbidden from entering the town, and it languished, slowly falling into disrepair and disuse. Since the Velvet Revolution of 1989, Marianska Lazia has been spruced up nicely, restored to its former glory. It has often been referred to as a town in a park and a park in a town. Clever. Like most Czech and Moravian spas, the treatments are pretty medicinal, usually for specific ailments. But hey, it's Europe, so sometimes a patient can even get a spa visit prescribed by their doctor. There are, however, several pretty nice hotels, each with their own spa facilities, and sometimes even limited access to the main town springs. These average between 1,200 and 2,000 crowns a night, which is 50 to 85 dollars U.S. The main thing you do in spa towns is drink lots of the local mineral water, eat a fair amount of good food, take long, leisurely walks in beautiful countryside and along the gorgeous colonnades, and maybe have a treatment or two. It's basically a colossal chill pill. For a little distraction in Marianska Lazia, and I do mean little, you can visit the Bohemianium, a hilltop six-hectare park containing miniature replicas of famous sites in Bohemia. It started off with six, like the pilgrimage church of St. John of Nepomuk, mentioned in a previous episode, the spiral tower of Krasno, which is mentioned a little bit further on in this episode, but since has grown and now has 75 miniature models. So for a mere 160 crown entry fee, you can see most of the highlights of Bohemia. Chateaus, castles, Yeshid TV tower, which I just mentioned, churches, a dam, a mini railway, the big gate in front of the Pilsner Urquell Brewery in Pilsen, teeny tiny wine cellars from South Moravia, also mentioned in a previous episode, bridges, windmills, an airport, and much, much more. There's even a mini model of what the old capital of the great Moravian Empire, Velegrad, maybe once looked like. All of this at a 1 to 25 scale. Next up in the triangle is Carlo Vivari, or KV, as those in the know refer to it. Though there is some evidence that this area had Bronze Age settlements, the legend goes that the King of Bohemia and Holy Roman Emperor Charles IV, Chuck IV, to those in the know, was hunting in the woods around here in 1349 when he discovered the first spring, and thus the name, which means Charles Springs, or Karlsbad in German. It got town privileges in 1370 by royal decree. So you could argue that, in some ways, this is the older spa town in the Bohemia Spa Triangle. Again, mainly German and German-speaking inhabitants who, who coexisted alongside a few Czechs in a kind of an uneasy alliance. This was the Sudetenland, and German residents objected to the area around KV getting incorporated into Bohemian territory after World War I. But too bad for them. They would, of course, be exiled after World War II, along with almost all the rest of the Germans in these lands. KV is certainly the largest of the Bohemian spa towns, about 50,000 residents, and gets lots and lots of visitors. Goethe hung around here, Chopin, Beethoven, who declared it his favorite place anywhere, Peter I of Russia, the Russian writer Turgenev, and many, many, many more. The mineral water Matrony is from around here, which is, for my money, the best mineral water in Europe that I've had, and it's an almost magical hangover cure. The unique Czech spirit Bakarovka is also made here in KV. There's more about both of those in a previous episode. That's the spirits about Czech booze. Then there's the Karla Vivari International Film Festival, which takes place every summer. This is one of the premier film fests in the world, showing around 180 films during its two-week run and attracting many famous film luminaries. Think of it as kind of the top of the second tier for film festivals. Top tier is Cannes, Venice, the Berlin Berlinale, those are the big three, and then you get maybe Sundance in Toronto and maybe Rotterdam. And then in the next tier, you'd have KV, Edinburgh, BFI London, South by South, Southwest, Tribeca, and Hong Kong. Though some people say, actually, KV is a bigger deal than the Rotterdam Festival. 
The town has several quite nice churches, a few of which are Russian Orthodox. Post Velvet Revolution, much of the spa section of the city has been bought by Russians, so many that I jokingly refer to it as Karlsgrad. The whole spa section is ridiculously beautiful, crawling up the sides of a very narrow valley through which flows a natural warm river called the Tepla River, which means warm river. You've seen Carlo Vivari in movies. The 2006 James Bond reboot Casino Royale was mainly filmed here, including the huge ground hotel Poop, which is spelled P-U-P-P, and also in the super pretty nearby town of Locket, which means elbow. The Last Holiday, released the same year, is also set here, starring Queen Latifah, LL Cool J, Timothy Hutton, and Gerard Depardieu, as well as a cameo by my friend Kami Hunt, interviewed in a previous episode about the art gallery she runs here in the city. Again, most treatments here are pretty medical in nature, and some even require a doctor's prescription. But there are a couple of hotels worth staying in that have their own spa facilities, and the city is gorgeous, with great buildings, lovely parks, lots of walking trails of different difficulty levels, a funicular up to one of the peaks, and much, much more. And the entire spa section of town is a no-smoking zone. That includes outside. One thing to try, besides the nasty-tasting spa waters, Bekharovka and Matuni, are spa wafers. These are big dinner plate-sized crunchy discs made out of, it's kind of almost like a sweet communion wafer, somewhere between a cracker and a cookie, with a thin, thin layer of quite sweet stuff of different flavors. They're totally awesome, and get them warm for an extra treat. They are serious sugar bombs. Marian Skelaznia, previously mentioned, also has their own version of spa wafers. If you love Christmas, and many people do, there is a large house, a mansion really, called Vanotsny Dum, which means Christmas house, that celebrates Christmas all year round. It's mainly a truly massive collection of teddy bears and Christmas tree decorations. But there's a lot of Christmas cheer here, especially down in the 650-year-old cellar, which is the main part of the museum. History buffs might want to check out the large statue of Karl Marx, who visited KV three times between 1874 and 1876. And that was good enough for local artist Karel Kunesh, who created the statue and unveiled it not far from the Russian Orthodox St. Peter and Paul Cathedral up on one of the hills back in May 1988, just a year and a half before communism fell in Czechoslovakia. Wah, wah. There's also a smaller bust of Marx in the colonnade down in the spa section of town. KV can easily be reached from Prague in about 90 minutes or so by bus. Do not take the train. The gauge changes to a very narrow one along the way, and the whole journey takes five hours or more. Take the bus. It's an hour and a half. There's also an airport if you have a bunch of money to burn. The new kid on the block and the third point in our Bohemian Spa Triangle is Franziskovi Laznia, or Franzenbad in German. Though the waters were thought to have curative powers as far back as the 14th century, the town itself wasn't founded until 1793, though there was a hotel built here in 1705, and the town was named after Emperor Francis II. Hmm. Though smaller than the other two, with only about 5,000 inhabitants, again, notables like Goethe and Beethoven, man, those two sure like spas, Theodor Herzl, Maria von Ebner Eschenbach, who wrote about her 1858 stay here in Aus Franzenbad, Emperor Francis Joseph I of Austria, Archduke Charles I of Austria, lots of Russian nobles, and more, helped put this place on the map. The first public spa house was built in 1827, and Franciszko Vilaznia was one of the first places in all of Europe to offer peat pulp baths. Mm. There are 24 springs in town, of which 12 are in use. In addition to peat, they are also famous for their mud baths. Like the other two places in the Triangle, this was mainly a German area, then they were booted out, then the communists closed it off, and then it was revived after 1989. Just before the Velvet Revolution, the local spa corporation was set up and is now the largest company of its kind in the country, operating seven hotels and one spa resort. The architecture is a mixture of neoclassical, belle époque, neo-renaissance, and even some art deco. There are many very well-designed parks. The spa and hotel situation is much the same as in the other two places mentioned, but a little bit cheaper here. Now, there are other spa towns in the region, though these generally are not really publicly accessible, or they're extremely specialized, like Lasnia Kinsvart, which specializes in nonspecific respiratory disorders in children ages 2 to 15. Probably not a place to get your chill out on. 
The whole region has lots of other things to do. As I mentioned before, the town of Lockett is absolutely gorgeous, and I cannot recommend it highly enough. There's also the Chateau of Bechov nad Teplo, an 18th century Baroque reconstruction of an earlier 14th century Gothic castle, which houses the reliquary of St. Marus. There's a nice botanical garden featuring some very rare trees for this area, if you like trees. There's another Baroque chateau at Ostrov, a botanical gardens with natural mineral springs crisscrossed by an instructional walking trail in the Slavkovsky Les Mountains, about 38 kilometers from KV. The Sous, S-O-O-S, Nature Reserve, about six kilometers from Frantiskova Lazia, features a geological park, peat bogs that are millions of years old, and dinosaur bones. Halfway between Mariansky Lazia and KV, in the middle of the Slavkov Forest, there is the unusual spiral tower of Krasno. Partly built as a lookout tower in 1935, but also as a tourist attraction, the main idea was to employ locals who'd fallen on hard times thanks to the worldwide depression. Thanks, Wall Street in New York. The designers took inspiration from tales of the Tower of Babylon and came up with this twisty tower that has 77 steps to get to the top. If you're in French, the small city of Hep is a mere seven kilometers to the south, and many people consider Francisco Vialaznia to be part of Hep. Hep has about 32,000 people. Once known as Ege in German, it was known for its distinctive northern Austro-Bavarian dialect. It was pretty much depopulated when the Germans were exiled, becoming a Czech city instead. A famous violin-making school is located here. In fact, this whole little area is well known for violin-making. There's the ruins of a 12th century castle, some pretty nice churches and towers, a fountain with a bagpipe player on top of it, because bagpipes are actually found all over the world, and more. Hep is a pleasant town and super easy to get to from Francisco de Lasnia. And that completes the items currently on the UNESCO list for the Czech Republic. Just to run them down again, they are the historic center of Prague, the center of Czeski Krumlov, Telch, the pilgrimage church of St. John of Nepomuk Zelenahora, Kutnohora, Lednets Voltica cultural landscape, the gardens and castle at Kromerzij, the Holashovica historical village reservation, Litomyshal castle or Zamek, the Holy Trinity column in Olomouc, the Tugendhat villa in Brno, the Jewish quarter and basilica in Trebich, and the four mentioned here. However, there's also the tentative list. The Czechs have 14 sites on there as well. Items must be placed on the tentative list and remain there for some time before they can even be considered to be added to the main list. So who knows, maybe someday these two will be on the official list. We've already talked about the TV Tower Hotel Restaurant Ski Resort at Yeshed, which is on there. Another item here is to extend the UNESCO Zone of Prague to include bits of Prague 6, like Pshevnov Abbey, which is mentioned in a previous episode about looking for the oldest pub in town, the modernist Mula Villa, and the Renaissance Havyezda Hunting Lodge and its grounds. The rest of the items on the tentative list we will talk about in a future episode of Prague Times. Thank you for listening, and don't forget you can subscribe to this podcast. Thank you for listening to this episode of Prague Times. If you liked this episode, be sure to like it or share it and tell your friends. Check us out on all of our social media platforms for extra goodies as well. Until next time, this has been Prague Times. <laughs>